Sister and I were discussing, well, sort of discussing, what subject I would uh, talk about today. Um, it was before, um, obviously before the election results this week uh, in America, and also really before we'd really considered what, um, what the impact of Brexit was going to be. So uh, for me, I think the subject today is even more um, relevant than perhaps I thought when I, when I first started uh, planning, or when we, when we were planning the semester's lectures last uh, uh, September. So those of you who don't know me, I'm Daphne, uh, Daphne Lane, I'm a lecturer here at, at the university. Um, my specialist subject over um, the last 15 years, that's well, one of my specialist subjects, has been global citizenship. The int interest, I'm very interested in the concepts, um, different concepts and understandings of global citizenship. Uh, and I worked in a, in a research group for various, um, with other universities um, looking at that concept and how it is expressed in different contexts. I'm not going to talk only about global citizenship today. I'm going to look at um, citizenship in general and propose three different models for the concept of being a citizen. Um, I hope that the aim of this talk will be to stimulate you to think about your understanding of being a citizen. I'm not going to give you any answers and I'm not going to go in great technical detail. But my, uh, my aim for this is for you to start to think about uh, the concepts of citizenship and being a citizen. Um, I've measured it, I'm going to talk for about an hour. If I talk for more than, if I seem to be rambling on, Lisa, can you please stop me? <clears throat> so my <coughs> presentation is going to take a uh, form of um, oh, a, a normal format, if you like, of, you, of, of a presentation. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the background just give you a little bit of background as to what the sort of background of citizenship and how the concept or notion, that's the idea of citizenship, developed. Um, then I'm going, we're going to look at three models. First, the model of a national citizen and what that actually means. What does it mean to be a, a citizen of a, 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 a nationality or a state? Uh, the second one, model 2-2 on that slide, that's good, isn't it? But it's actually model 2. Uh, citizen of a group of states, so a sort of federal model, uh, and you'll, you'll see what I mean um, a little bit later on. Uh, and then thirdly, looking at concepts of the global citizen. Before I start, I want you just to turn to your neighbours and just discuss for a minute, um, I'm going to time you, just discuss for a minute what do you, what does this term of citizen mean to you right now? What does it actually mean? Uh, if you're sitting next to somebody uh, from, a, uh, from a different group, that's even better, because I know some of you have already discussed this in your class. So what do you understand by the term citizen? Um, does it mean knowledge, what you know? Does it mean a responsibility, what you should do, a duty? Or does it mean something else? Okay, so just about two minutes, or three minutes.
you to save your discussions. Hopefully that's helped you to think about the idea and start to think about the vocabulary that you might need. So hopefully that's brought all the, all the words to your, the front of your mind. And save up those, con uh, those concepts for discussion a bit later on. Um, you probably in your... I'm going to turn the page. <laughs> Probably in your discussion you mentioned something to do with nationality. There is now, nowadays, uh, a close link between nationality and citizenship. Most of us have passports that say citizen of, which is kind of almost the same as nationality. But I'm going to argue in this lecture that Citizenship is something quite different from nationality. Um, I also realise in my lead-up discussions uh, with, with some of my students that uh, some of you are very familiar with citizenship and the concept of citizen in your school education and so on. In the UK, we don't study citizenship. We don't study what it means to be a citizen. Um, in Wales, where some of you know I come from. In Wales they do study uh, concepts of, of, of citizenship, but at the moment in the UK we don't actually study that in schools. So um, for the benefit of definition, I looked in the Oxford English Dictionary, always a good place to look for, when, look when you're looking at a, dis, a definition. And the Oxford English Dictionary says that citizenship is the status of a person recognised under the custom or law as being a member of a state. So a state is different from a country. <coughs> a person may have multiple citizenships, and a person who does not have citizenship of any state is said to be stateless. And this is a very relevant um, discussion in the present moment when there are so many people in this world who are effectively stateless, when they've had to be they've been driven from their countries because of war or other kind of conflict or persecution. There are many, many, many people who we, we hear about, we read about, um, who we know about, who are stateless through no fault of their own. There are also many, many people who do not meet this criterion, the, the strict criterion, simply because they haven't, uh, they haven't become members. So there are many people, not so much in the UK, but uh, for example in America, 35% of Americans, or up to 35% of Americans, do not hold citizenship, do not actually hold a passport that says they are a citizen of America. But I'm sure that all of those people, if you asked them, they would say that they are citizens. So what does a citizen <coughs> share? Well, a citizen shares... Norms. What do you think a norm is? A norm is something that we think is normal. All of you have travelled usually thousands of miles to come and study in the UK. Probably until you came to the UK, you considered that everything, uh, every way of doing things, uh, the society that you grew up was normal. Probably now you're starting to notice that there are other ways of doing things. We call that cultural, yeah, there's a cultural uh, culture shock where you realise that what you consider <coughs> as normal is actually only just the way that you do it. So what citizens share, the broader concept of citizen, is norms. What we consider, we, the citizens, our co-citizens consider as normal. Um, that's an understanding of how the world is, really. Behaviours, so how we behave, whether we smile or not, um, what we do in particular circumstances. So a list of uh, behaviours, ways in which we act, which again we consider to be normal. But we share those behaviours, the ways um, I noticed it, I went to London yesterday evening, and you always notice a tourist in London because they don't know that you stand on the right of the escalator and you walk up the left. 
Yeah? If you stand on the left, all the local Londoners will stare at you as if you're wrong. Because the behaviour in London, you stand on the right and you walk on the left. Um, and I've noticed that in other, in other countries where I've, where I've studied, uh, where I've visited, there are these accepted behaviours where everybody understands what they're doing and they understand the right way to behave. So that could be a behaviour or a practice. Practices, um, we've been talking a little bit about Christmas, for example. We all kind of know, we don't, Christmas originally was a Christian festival, but Christmas is much bigger than that in the UK. Um, it would be very, it would be quite unusual to find somebody in the UK who has no, um, who, who has no experience of Christmas. Uh, so practices can be do, to do with uh, religious, secular, festivals, celebrations, the way that we celebrate birthdays, for example. Um, and uh, also things like um, heroes. Who do, we, who do we admire? Who do we respect? So that it's, it's, there's a link with cultural uh, knowledge and cultural understandings there. Um, so those things that we, we share with each other. Okay, so now I'm going to move to a little bit of a background to um, the idea of citizenship. So imagine a world without aeroplanes, without internet, where the only way that you could travel was to walk. Or if you were very lucky, you might have uh, already might have horses, for example. But that wasn't common. So right back in, the histo in, in history, um, a sense of belonging was very, very local. Yeah? And you understood as a, as a member of society that you kind of belonged to that very small uh, society that you belonged to. So there probably wasn't a rule of law. There probably wasn't um, a king somewhere else. There was probably a head in your, in your village or in your area. And probably the people who you came into contact with were just people within a day's walk or a day's travel from your, from your tribe or your clan. So that was a sense of belonging. So they were citizens. They had a sense of belonging, and I think the key to that, really, is that the knowledge, the understanding of what made you a member of that clan or that tribe or that group was probably implicit. And implicit means you didn't need to write it down. Actually, you probably couldn't write it down. You didn't really need to write it down. So we're going a long way back in history. When I went to um, Kurdistan four years ago, uh, I saw one of the oldest stone tablets in the world with a, with a written rule of law on the stone. I was absolutely amazed. And I, I'm not a historian, so I can't remember how old it was, but it was more than 4,000 years old, <coughs> a written. So we're talking a long time ago before there was any sort of written law, okay? When rules were implicit. Okay, and then came the time of um, empires. Now, empires didn't... When you were a member of an empire, you didn't need to share all of the, all of the knowledge that everybody else in that empire had. Um, we'll look at that a little bit later. And then moving into our own life now, our own world, if you like, um, where we all move from one place to another, we talk to each other. I've already talked this morning with um, somebody in South Africa, somebody in Australia, somebody in <coughs> Italy, and somebody in Oman, by chance, because they're messaging me, because the time is different. Yeah, they're, they're, they're already awake in all of those places. And that's normal for us all, isn't it? Because we're all global citizens. Okay, so as I was saying, the, histori the historical belonging, the tribe or the clan, that means a group of, a group of people. It's just an old word for uh, a group of people. We, there are various 
um, term, there's various terminology uh, in anthropology and elsewhere. Um, so the tribe had a known regulatory system. They knew what they needed to do. And they were fairly certain as to what, where they belonged. And it was probably location, uh, family. In fact, often you'll find with, with societies that are tribal, um, there's, not, there's not really a joint between family and other members of your, of your tribe. Uh, and very little understanding that individuals belonged to a larger state or country um, or even an empire. Then that led on gradually with the growth of script language. That means written language. When suddenly there's a development of an idea that not, you are not alone, if you like. That there are others out there who share your sense of belonging. But you may never have met, for example, the king or the, 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 the head of your particular region. Okay? So growing slowly larger. Um, the ruler is distant, we, have, we don't see the ruler, but you kind of know something about the ruler through probably word of mouth, not probably through what written. So there are some <coughs> written uh, rules. Um, the birth of science, so that an understanding of science, suddenly meant that there was a reduction in the feeling of certainty. So who am I? Oh, I'm not sure. Because science caused um, a reduction in the certainty about how the world was and where your place, where, where our place in the world was. Okay, so moving on. Empires existed and exist all over the world. We all know about empire. Of course, the British Empire is a good example of an empire where um, I think at the end of the 19th century, more than half the world was coloured pink, we used to say, because on the map, um, countries that belonged to, uh, to Britain. But empire wasn't a new thing in the British Empire. It, it goes a long way further back than that. Um, in China, the dynasties in China didn't respect national boundaries because the boundaries, the national boundaries, didn't exist. So the dynasties really were about a, a, an area over which um, the particular emperor ruled at a particular time. We all know that it comes into conflict. So there was an understanding between those people that they belonged to a particular empire. Uh, another good example is the Ottoman Empire, which was enormous and really un uh, shared very little else but an understanding of who the uh, of, of where the rules were made. The Ottoman Empire was enormous. They didn't share language. They didn't share um, characteristics. You know, people who looked like us. But nevertheless, it was a, an empire which was ruled over for many years, as you, as you know, and reached uh, right into Europe and right back as far as nearly as far as China. And then the Soviet Union, another good example of, a, of, a, of an empire. An empire which was built on an ideology. So rather than built on conquering you know, with, <coughs> by a war, but built on an ideology. We may argue that there was war. We won't go there now. We're lo not looking at war today. But the Soviet Union was built on, on an ideology, so a way of thinking, the communist um, ideology. I suppose we could, we could argue that in China too, but China has been um, a, large, a country for a very, very, very long time, even though the dynasties might have sort of shrunk and, and expanded. And then step by step, with the growth of science, the growth, as I said, of a sense of place and a sense of belonging, and also a sense of looking at your neighbour and thinking, you are like me. <coughs> the idea of nations slowly grew in importance. So when you were 
about when you were, when we were members of empires. We didn't need to share a language, we didn't really need to share very much at all. Uh, there was a sort of rule of law, but it wasn't up to us. We just got on with our lives. Yeah? Uh, occasionally rules were imposed upon us, but or taxes. We're not really, we weren't really um, affected by the, the empire day to day. So with the concept of nation came more, much more of a sense of responsibility and a move towards a national identity, which became synonymous with kind of shared features or similarities. <coughs> and an identity with your community. <coughs> okay, so that brings me to the first model I'm going to look at. I'm not going to give you a lovely diagram. If I was really good at uh, drawing diagrams, uh, I, would, I, would, I would be able to make a wonderful model there. But I'm going to describe it instead. So a national citizen. We're all, probably we're all national citizens. A national citizen, what is it expected to know? Well, I've been doing some research into what a national system, as a citizen, is supposed to know. And I've done that um, by a research into citizenship tests and talking to, to you and friends in other countries and, and friends and, and colleagues here in the UK. So what is a citizen supposed to know? It seems that a citizen is supposed to know some traditions. So they're supposed to know, for example, what the important days in a year might be. And how those are celebrated. You're supposed to know the law, some of the law, not all the law, obviously, that's for lawyers, but you're supposed to know uh, the outline of the law. So, for example, in the UK, you're supposed to know how old you need to be before you drink alcohol or before you drive a car or before you start a, I don't know, um, oh no, that's a bit, that's a bit later. <clears throat> um, it seems to me that there is a, there's a movement nowadays um, towards citizens also needing to understand a little bit about the history of the country. When I was growing up, I don't think we really had this idea that we needed to know the history. Um, but there seems to be a bit of a movement, um, particularly in Europe, in, um, in rooting us much more strongly in our history. So we need to know a little bit of history. And when I looked at the citizenship test, there is a link on your, um, in your notes. You'll be able to look at the, the English, the citizenship test with some examples of the uh, questions that you need to answer if you want to become a citizen of the UK, uh, you'll see that history figures quite largely. And I didn't do very well, because I don't really know history of the UK. Um, I sort of struggled with my history tests, with my history, um, uh, the history questions. And then obviously you need to know how to do things, like I said about the walking up and down the escalators, or how to how to buy something in a supermarket, all of those things, you kind of need to know in order to be uh, there. Obviously, if you become a citizen of, let's say, if you're trying to become a citizen of the UK, then you also need to know um, the, how, to, how to go about becoming a citizen, how to go about maybe wanting to apply to, become, to, to get married, um, how to go about uh, the things that we take very, very much for granted, like opening a bank account. All of those things are kind of shared knowledge that we don't think about until we go to somewhere else where we don't know how to do that. So shared understandings, what we understand, shared rights, what are we allowed to do, what are we not allowed to do. I noticed talking to a lot of international students, probably most of the people I talk to during the week are international students, um, they often know more about my rights than I do. Because 
I think it's just normal. I think everybody has those rights, you know. But we do take our rights for granted. Um, those of you who are from countries where uh, you might not have so many rights, you might be more uh, sure of what your rights are or not. Um, shared communication, important. But we can talk to each other. That's controversial as well. And implicit knowledge. I said implicit knowledge, meaning knowledge that we don't we don't talk about particularly, but we understand that everybody knows that. So when we start our conversation, we don't need to explain what we're talking about because we think that the person we're talking of, talking to understands that. As I said, there's a link on the, the notes here. The link is here. Um, for you to have a look at some of the questions. If you applied to become a UK citizen, these are some of the questions. And you probably know there's a Life in the UK um, exams that you can take now in, in English. And so, uh, so if, you're, if you're wanting to come and live in the UK, you won't be taking an IELTS, for example. You'll be taking the Life in the UK test. And so those are some practice questions. Okay, so some controversies. Let's keep these in mind. Controversies mean things that are open to question, things that people discuss, and things that people argue about. I mean in an academic way, but often not in an academic way too. So what about language? Is it important to speak the language of the state where you live? If you speak the language, does that mean that you feel that you belong in a place, or is it completely separate from any other sense of how you, how you feel? How about culture, religious, religion and politics? Um, English people love politics, but they like to talk about politics in a general way. They don't like to give their... Um, they don't like to give their... They don't like to tell each other exactly how they're going to vote. So they see politics as something that is okay to discuss, but maybe not talking about voting. But it's very controversial, okay? Some people don't really don't like talking about politics. Um, and I know in other countries it's more so, even more so. When I asked my students here uh, in level two, I said, oh, you shouldn't really talk about politics in, uh, in China. You can talk about other countries' politics, but not ours. I quite like that, because I think we probably do the same. We're doing the same now, we're talking about Trump. <laughs> well, actually, I'm not talking about Trump. And so how much should citizens share? So if you are all citizens of something, what do you share? Okay. In a nationality and country, um, and then we'll look at the other, the other uh, models in a minute. And where is the boundary between citizenship and identity? So all of us have our own identity. We have a culture which is shared in our group. Identity and citizenship, where is the relationship between those two things? How much do you think I am first and foremost? <coughs> this or not? Okay, so we're moving on now to the second model. So the first model is national of the state. The second model, this kind of this might become more interesting now in the way that you might not have thought about this kind of citizenship. Most people think about citizenship as being a citizen of a country. We are all, sorry, we, Lisa and myself um, have probably, I certainly have three citizenships um, and they are not all national. I would regard myself as a citizen of the UK because I have a passport and I call it the United Kingdom because I feel more comfortable about saying that than English or British, uh, so the United Kingdom. I'm also a citizen of the European Union at the moment. That also says that on my passport. And I feel very proud of that. And the European Union is an example of a federal, of a group of states, so countries, which agreed to come together. Each state has its own independence and its own system, 
and its own citizens, but each of those states belong to um, a greater, larger um, group. So I've got a, a, a definition now of, of what I mean by federal, again from the dictionary, which is um, the Oxford English Dictionary again. So having or relating to a system of government which several states form a unity but remain independent in their internal affairs. Okay, so I'm just going to run through now a few examples um, of EU. Uh, I used to teach EU citizenship and this, these are some of the slides from, from that course in, from, from the uh, European Union. Okay, so EU citizenship, it's a federation of states. 28 at the moment. At the moment, I have to say, it is controversial and divisive. You all know that. We all know that. You know, those of you who are taught by me know that I'm very sad about the controversies and the divisions in the European Union. Um, but there are, as you also know, a lot of people who don't agree with me, who think that, it's, that the European Union has gone too far, so identity is no longer possible. Um, with one's own state and the European Union. And I had to mention Brexit because obviously it's in all of our minds at the moment. We don't know what is going to happen in the future. Um, we're very, very worried, um, especially those of us in, in, um, in international professions, um, about what's going to happen in the future. And we really don't know how, how Britain or the, UK, the United Kingdom is going to relate to Europe in the future. <coughs> so as I said, 28 countries. The first six there are in blue. They were then joined by the yellow ones, or the gold ones. And then progressively, By more and more, we were fur uh, moving further and further east. So you can see the pink ones was a very big movement after the fall of the Soviet Union when, uh, when, the, when the European Union expanded hugely. There are now 500 million people in the European Union. I guess there might be 500 million and one. So about 500 million people. And there are 24 official languages. <coughs> I suppose one of the questions that we want to think about in the future is, will English be an official language of the European Union? Because at the moment, the languages are related to the states. And there are four basic freedoms. The freedom of movement of people, so people can move from one state to another for the purposes of work or leisure, and they can live uh, freely in any other country that is a member of the European Union. Secondly, the freedom of movement of goods, so things, products, again, can be moved from one state to another without having to pay taxes. Okay, so if, if a BMW car is made in Germany, can go to, it can be exported to France without paying extra taxes. So it's a trade, and it was originally a trading uh, federation. And then the right of establishment and freedom to provide services. That's things like health services, um, to, to provide, if you, if you go to another European state, you're allowed to start a business and provide a service, not just products. And lastly, important, the European Central Bank movement of money from one state to another. So at the moment, that is free of, free of additional regulations from one country to another. But what's important is that there is a system of law that overrides all of the nation states to confirm those four essential freedoms. 
Okay, so there is a law which dictates how you can export money, for example, how you can move money from one state to another, how, and, and people and so on. So I just quite liked that um, that slide, which is what um, it represents what Europe, Europeans, the European Union, what. Um, values a European Union citizen is expected to share. So not only the freedoms, they are the dove, the four freedoms, but also equality, so that every citizen is considered to be equal. Dignity, that every citizen has the right to be treated with respect. Solidarity, that we support every state and citizen support each other. That they have the same rights, equal rights, and those are, are dictated by the, the European Union um, in Strasbourg or Brussels. And justice, so there is a, a legal code, which is based on a constitution. And I just thought I'd put this as if you were going to study European Union uh, citizenship, which most other European countries do, it would sort of include those things. Because that might go back to your original conversation, what do we need to know? What do we share? What responsibilities do we have as a citizen? So as a European citizen, EU citizen, sorry, you would be expected to understand the structures and the institutions. So to understand how uh, the place comes together. Think about your own country and your own citizenship. Do you know about the structures? How does it work? How does the law work? How does politics work? And where are the institutions are? So where, does, where is your government? Where is the parliament? Of course you know that. Specific national context. So in, in addition to that, the local context. And to share the vision. So those lovely pictures that I sh just showed you, equality, dignity, etc., etc., And to be able to discuss the dilemmas and issues freely in Parliament. So to the ability to be able to discuss uh, contra controversies and difficult things. And to develop identity and facilitate intercultural learning. Well, that's what we're really, really doing here. We feel really strongly that we want you not only to come to Brooks or not only to come to the UK to, um, to learn your subject, but also that you'll go back with a lot of extra things. You'll, le you'll have learned a lot more and hopefully you'll have made friends who you stay friends with for the rest of your lives. Okay, so why is this controversial? I had to put this in. This is a model of how Britain voted after in the Brexit election. So, um, just put your hands up. Who in this room, who has discussed Brexit with a British person, except me or Lisa? One, good. Two, three, four. Great, there's quite a few. Interesting. Okay. So, in fact, Bre what one really good thing about Brexit is that we all started talking to each other. For years, British people didn't talk about it. Oh no, I've got an opinion. I don't want to tell anybody about it.